Okay, this is part 18 of Nosferatu. Various locales. It was raining hard in Chesapeake, Virginia on the evening of May 9th, 1993, when Jeff Hayden took his Springer Spaniel for the usual after-dinner walk. Neither of them wants to be out, not Hayden, not his dog Garbo. The rain was coming down so hard on Battlefield Boulevard that it was bouncing off the concrete sidewalks and the cobblestone driveways. The air smelled fragrantly of stage and holly. Jeff wore a big yellow poncho and wind, scra and wind snatched at it and rattled it furiously. Garbo spread her back legs and squatted miserably to pee, her curly fur hanging in wet tangles. Hayden and Garbo's walk took them past the sprawling Tudor home of Nancy Lee Martin, a wealthy widow with a nine-year-old daughter. Later, he told the investigators with Chesapeake PD that he glanced up her driveway because he heard Christmas music, but that wasn't quite the truth. He didn't hear Christmas music then, not over the pounding roar of the rain on the road, but he always want, walked past her house and always looked up her driveway because Hayden had a bit of a crush on Nancy Lee Martin. At 42, she was 10 years older than him, but still looked much like the Virginia Tech cheer Virginia Tech cheerleader she had once been. He peered up the lane just in time to see Nancy coming out the front door with her daughter Amy racing ahead of her. A tall man in a black overcoat held an umbrella for her. The girls had on slinky dresses and silk scarves, and Jeff Hayden remembered his wife saying that Nancy Lee was going to a fundraiser for George Allen, who had just announced he was running for governor. Hayden, who owned a Mercedes dealership and who had an eye for cars, recognized her ride as an early Rolls Royce, the Phantom or the Wraith, something from the 30s. He called out and lifted a hand in greeting. Nancy Lee Martin might have waved back, he wasn't sure. As her driver opened the door, music flooded out, and Hayden could have sworn he heard the strains of Little Drummer Boy sung by a choir. That was an odd thing to hear in the spring. Maybe even Nancy Lee thought it was odd. She seemed to hesitate before climbing in. But it was raining hard, and she, dis and she didn't hesitate long. Hayden walked on, and when he returned, the car was gone. Nancy Lee Martin and her daughter, Amy, never arrived at the George Allen fundraiser. The driver who had been scheduled to pick her up, Malcolm Arkroyd, vanished as well. His car was found off Bain Bridge Boulevard down by the water, the driver's side door open. His hat was found in the weeds, saturated with blood. In late May of 1994, it was Jake Christensen of Buffalo, New York, 10 years old and traveling alone, flying in from Philadelphia where he attended boarding school. A driver had been sent to meet him, but this man, Bill Black, suffered a fatal heart attack in the parking garage and was found dead behind the wheel of his stretch limo. Who met Jake at the airport, who drove him away, was never determined. The autopsy revealed that Bill Black's heart had failed after absorbing near-lethal doses of a gas called sovoflurane. It was a favorite of dentists. A faceful world a face full would switch off a person's awareness of pain and make him highly suggestible. A zombie, in other words. Sibo Florin wasn't so easy to get. You needed a license to practice medicine or dentistry to obtain it. And it seemed a promising lead, but statewide interviews with oral surgeons and the people they employed went exactly nowhere. In 1995, it was Steve Colone and his 12-year-old daughter, Charlie, Charlena, actually, but Charlie to her friends, on their way to a father-daughter dance in Plattsburgh, New York. They ordered a stretch limo, but it was a Rolls Royce that turned up in their driveway instead. Charlie's mother, Agatha, kissed her daughter on the forehead before she left, told her to have fun, and never laid eyes on her again. She saw her husband, though. His body was found bullet through the left eye behind some bushes in a rest area off Interstate 87. Agatha had no trouble identifying the body in spite of the damage to his face. Months later, in the fall, the phone rang in the Con Conlin house a little after 2.30 in the morning, and Agatha, only half awake, answered. She heard a hiss and crackle as of a long-distance connection being made, and then several children began to sing the first Noel, their high, sweet voices quivering with laughter. Agatha believed she heard her daughter's voice among them and began to scream her name, Charlie, Charlie, where are you? But her daughter did not reply, and in another moment, the children hung up on her. The phone company, however, said no call had been made to her house at that time, and the police wrote it off as the late-night fantasy of a distraught woman. 
Around 58,000 non-family child abductions occur every each year in America, and in the early 90s, the disappearances of Marta Gorgowski, Rory McCombers, Amy Martin, Jake Christensen, Charlene Conlon, and the adults who vanished with them, with few n- witnesses in different states under various conditions, were not connected until much later. Not until well after what happened to Vic McQueen at the hands of Charlie Talent Mannix the third.